Hey everybody, it's Pastor Tom and Tammy, and here we are for another episode of Truth Talks. And this is episode 10 of Angels 101. It is the final episode of our Angels and Spiritual uh, Warfare discussions. So I'm excited about today. Why don't you start us out with prayer, Tammy? Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you um, for the uh, revelation knowledge and for the mm. weapons that you have given us and that as we talk about these tonight that we will um, understand them more and learn how to use them in Jesus yes. name, Jesus amen. Name. Amen. So I wanna say this before we get started with this discussion. I think it's very important. A lot of people think that Christians should just be these mamsy, pamsy, just we go, oh, you know, kind of, you know, we should take it. And I don't believe that. I believe there are certain things. We will be persecuted. There will be persecution for the sake of the word of God. But when it comes to spiritual warfare against satanic forces, we have to know what God has provided for us and we have to know how to use it. So if you get a gun Hopefully, you've taken some kind of a training or someone has shown you how to use that gun. Um, that's what this is. This is spiritual training mm -hmm. in how to use the community that you are now living in, which is the community of Christ. So very important. So in Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to read this here in just a minute, but Paul gives us the analogy of a Roman soldier to uh, identify the different types of uh, our armor. And we're going to show a picture of a Roman soldier now and all of the various parts of the armor and what that looked like at the time when Paul wrote this. So... In Sunday school class, we actually have a plastic set of armor. Actually, it was our kids, mm -hmm. I, believe it was, I believe it was Trent's, um, where you could dress up like the Roman soldier and all the parts of the armor, and it had the names of what the, the pieces of armor were for. And it's a, a very good uh, visual representation mm -hmm. of the spiritual armor that we have. So Ephesians 6, 13 through 18. All right, here we go. Um, six? Third, mm -hmm. Are we going to start with ten? Um, we can start with ten. Ephesians 6, ten. I guess it's really part of it. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, um, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and with all prayer, all manner of prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. That's a big, that's a big, it that's is. a lot of armor. It is. We need the armor of God. And we're going to take this apart verse by verse and ar piece of armor by <clears throat> piece of armor. So the first one is, uh, I think King James calls it the girdle of truth, which is the belt or the loin belt. And it's mentioned first. So truth is mentioned first. So the very first thing you have to have to uh, be on guard and protected against the temptation of Satan is the truth. You have to know the truth. The word of God is truth. You have to know it. If you don't know it, he's going to trip you mm -hmm. up because mm -hmm. you're not going to know the difference mm -hmm. between the lie and the truth if you do not know what the actual right. truth is. Well, the other thing is they call it a girdle. 
of course we don't today we call it a belt mm -hmm. but um it keeps your pants up <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> in the case <laughs> of in paul's day um, men and women, it's, I'm reading this here, mm -hmm. men and women normally wore long, loose garments that came down at least to their knees. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Before undertaking any strenuous activity, the first thing they did was pull their garments up so that their legs could probably move freely and they could do the work in the fields or whatever and not get the lower part of their garment dirty. They'd pull that up, wrap their belt around it, and tighten the belt and then they were free to do the work they needed mm -hmm. to do. Uh, I've got something here. Um, this book is called Dress to Kill. It's an awesome book. Um, and it talks completely, like in great detail about the armor. And this is um, something from this book that I thought was really good. So the loin belt for a Roman soldier held all the pieces of the armor together. So. He might not be wearing all of his great weapon weaponry, but if his loin belt was not in place, everything else was going to fall apart. So the uh, soldier's shield was attached to the belt. Uh, if he had no loin belt, he had no resting place for that massive shield. So there was a place on the belt. Uh, if he had on no loin belt, he had no place to hang the sword. There was like a place on it where you hung the sword. Think about like a carpenter's tool belt, mm -hmm. that belt that mm -hmm. where all the stuff went. Um, if there was no belt, there was no place for his lance to rest upon. Uh, if there was no belt, there was nothing to keep his breastplate from flapping in the wind because the belt kept that in. So it kept everything together. Mm -hmm. Same for us. The truth of God's word is what keeps everything together and mm -hmm. is the, the first most critical part of our armor because without the truth, there's right. everything falls apart. Right. It's all going to fall apart. Right. Well, in Jesus, in a recent message I did, we talked about truth, that Jesus said the truth will set you free. Yeah. So truth is very important to that whole kit, so mm -hmm. to speak. All the kitting out of your armor, right. the truth has to be in place. Right. Next is... So, next, uh, verse The breastplate of righteousness. 15. No, 14 still. Bre oh, so 14. Breastplate of righteousness. Okay. This protects our heart. Um, in... Proverbs 4.23, it says, Keep or guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. So our success in the spiritual life depends on maintaining a right heart and a right relationship with God. Mm -hmm. This is the problem with a lot of Christians. We think, oh, I'm bigger then going to church. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to go to fellowships. I don't need to be part of things. I'm good. I've got this. I see this all the time. As soon as people step out of fellowship, that's when things go off the rails. And it's, you know what? Some people might say, oh, you're a pastor. That's just what they say. They just want the money. You know what? Give me a break. You know what? You go to the store and you buy things at the store and you think nothing about about paying the price that they have on the ticket but you know what there's something about being together in the fellowship of the believers of course there's it takes money to have a building to do certain things to have things the way we like to have them in modern society um so that's part of the whole thing. When we get out of fellowship, we run the risk of the armor being ineffective. So righteousness is a big word. Guard your heart. What does righteousness mean? Righteousness means rights with God. We say in America, I have rights. Hey, you know, I've, I've read this that, you know, people don't, aren't read their rights that the judge, sometimes judges will throw that case out because their, their right was violated that their, because the Supreme Court decided everyone must be read their rights. And if they're not read their rights, then their case could be dismissed by a judge. Not all the time does that happen, but it happens because 
we, we have this, we have rights with God when we accept Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says, I think it's 1 Corinthians 1.30, could be 2, 2, 2 Corinthians, one or, I, I forget which one it is, but it's 1, chapter 1, verse 30. And it says, Jesus is made righteousness to us. Jesus purchased our rights to stand before God. So when we put on this breastplate of righteousness, that's our rights. We're protected. We're standing in we're, we're st rightness. We're right. We can walk into the throne room of God with rights. Before Jesus, we couldn't do yeah. that. So um, in uh, a Roman soldier's uh, outfit, the breastplate was the shiniest part. They, they were made out of brass, and it was the, it was the part that you're going to see first. It's the bright, shiny part that's on him. Um, so people didn't see the belt of truth because it was covered up with the breastplate. They saw the right, the breastplate, which was, is righteousness. And it was very conspicuous. Um, it was the heaviest piece of weaponry that a Roman soldier wore, often weighed an excess of 40 pounds. That's mm. how heavy this breastplate was. The importance was, of protecting It was the heavy breast. stuff. Um, so... They were made out of brass, so you know if, if you rub brass and they would rub together, they would get shiny. Um, if you use a brass handrail, you see them in a hotel or something, the parts of the handrail that everybody's hand touches is shiny. The other parts can look kind of dull. So these breastplates were made out of these pieces of metal and they would connect together. And when they would use them and wear them, they'd rub together so they became very shiny with use. And if you just think about if you saw an entire legion of Roman soldiers walking in the sun and the sun hits them, that breastplate's going to just sparkle and shine in the sun. So our righteousness is not only a defensive weapon that protects us against blows of the enemy, but it's also an offensive weapon to assist as we assault the enemy and take back lost territory. Mm -hmm. So it's it's our righteousness. Mm -hmm. It's our right standing in God. We have the right to take back that territory. So because the devil desires to penetrate and immobilize a person's mind and emotions, we talked about that last time, that's where the battle is. Uh, he especially des delights in finding believers who do not know that they are righteous. If you don't know you're righteous, you're gonna be an easy prey. Mm -hmm. That's how critical. Well, and sometimes that. people mix up holiness and righteousness. Mm -hmm. That righteousness is something they have to do. No, it's no. not. It's something provided for you by Jesus Christ. However, holiness is something that you do. Right. You separate yourself unto God. Separation is holiness. So I want to read this. In Romans 10, it says. <clears throat> The word is near you, verse, let me see, verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. And it, um, oh, da, 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 da. here we go. Oh, let me get back to this. Help me, Jesus. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we are pre preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart... A person believes, resulting in righteousness. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that this breastplate is covering the heart, the right. spirit of man, not the beating heart, but the spirit of man, where we believe and receive righteousness. Right. The rights that we have before God are critical because with no rights, you will be defeated. And I wanted to read this because it's just so good. It's in this book, Dressed to Kill. Christians who don't know they have been made righteous in Christ tend to habitually walk in condemnation. Why? Because the devil never misses a chance to insert a condemnation and a condemning thought in their minds. People who don't know they've been made righteous also continually will walk in guilt for the same reason. The enemy loves to bombard them with lying accusations that penetrate their minds and make them feel like they're a failure. No word of condemnation, no false allegation, which is a lie, 
and no guilty thought will penetrate your heart, which you just talked about, actually your heart mm -hmm. here, or lodge in your mind when you're walking in and wearing the breastplate of righteousness. Mm -hmm. Yes. Praise the Lord. Okay. okay let's get let's back to this. Let's go on to uh, verse six, the next eight. part of the armor. Sorry. I turned over to Romans and... Lost your place. Lost my place. All right. What does it say? Oh, here we are. It, verse 15, mm -hmm. right? And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So we all know how important shoes are. Shoes are critical. <laughs> to wear, not just in a battle, but shoes are very important to wear on your feet. And these are shoes of peace, mm -hmm. the gospel of peace. Well, um, and, you know, I like this other study that we've read here. Uh, Roman legionaries were equipped with strong sandals. Those mm -hmm. men walked all over Europe in sandals. Yeah. These uh, made them highly mobile, and they could uh, make long forced marches, as, marches at short notice. As Christians, we need to be mobile, and this is the biggest issue with the body of Christ. People get settled down in their church, and they're just hunkered down and ready to just do nothing. And that's not what we're called to. We're called to move forward out of this place, out of this building, and out with our testimony and the, the what is it? Uh, what, what is that again? Sheet, feet, <laughs> sheet, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So in the Roman military, so these shoes, um, they were made out of bronze or, or brass and leather. So they were sandals. So they had metal on them, but they were held together with leather. Well, they were probably um, held together with metal uh, pins. Well, they had a tube-like piece of bronze or brass that began at the top of the knee and extended down past the lower leg. So basically a shin. A sh they had a shin, a shin guard. guard on them. Think of soccer. Mm -hmm. Um so they had this guard on them, and they also it said that on the bottom of the shoes, they had spikes on the bottom that were one or more inches long. Whew. So if wow. a soldier was in combat, his spikes could have uh, been killer shoes. I mean, they mm -hmm. had spikes on the shoes. They were killing so machines, Kind of a combination of a, a soccer shin guard and what are those cleats? The, yeah, tra the track cleats and, have little spikes uh, on them, yeah. but these were bigger. So Paul knew about what these, what these shoes looked like that the Roman soldiers wore, and that's what he was writing about these. So peace is a defensive and offensive weapon too. Peace will protect you because if you're in peace, you're calm, you're protected. Uh, but it also will provide you a weapon against the enemy because if he tries to come against you with fear and you're in peace, then it will keep you from uh, succumbing to that attack. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um and if you had on uh, shoes like these Roman soldiers did, uh, one good kick, you could crush the enemy's strategies mm -hmm. with those spikes uh, that were on those shoes. So um, the having your feet shod, this is an interesting thing too. The word shod, uh, a compound combination of the word, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it in Hebrew, but it means binding something together very tightly on the bottom of one's foot. That's what the, uh, the feet shod would be, binding it tightly on your foot. So it's, it's not the picture of something loose fitting. This is something that would have been tightly bound on their foot. Mm -hmm. It uh, would have so, almost been like one with their leg and their foot. Yes. It had to be, right? right. It couldn't flop around or it right. would make them, it, would, it yes. would compromise their ability to fight. And that's how we need to be with peace. That mm -hmm. peace shouldn't be something that is right. loosely on us. No. Peace should be constantly, we should be bound in peace in, in or peace. wrapped, <clears throat> encased in peace. Right. Peace is confidence too, mm -hmm. that you don't have peace if you're not confident. No. So if we have confidence in what Christ has done for us and in this righteousness and life in which we live, we will have peace that we are victorious. Yes. All right, the shield of faith. The shield of faith. Um, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And I like this, uh, what it says here. The word here translated shield 
is connected with the word for a door. I don't know if you've seen these movies with, you know, with Roman battles or whatever. The Roman shield was very big. They could actually put all of their shields side to side and over top and arrows coming from the enemy had no effect and on them. Like a turtle and they kind would, of like they would move slowly shell. forward mm -hmm. and then they would be in the middle and they would come out just that's that sound effect is very important. <laughs> um, okay. Um, what else about shield effect? So well they were wide, they were long, and they gave adequate cover mm -hmm. over over. And the shield of faith covers our life. It's it covers us. So matter no how matter how hard or how long the enemy will beat against your faith, your faith can outlast the attack mm -hmm. because it's a shield that is around you, that protects you. Um, the Roman shields were made of six layers of animal hide that made them uh, durable, tough, thick leather. They could become stiff and breakable over a period of time, so they had to take care of them properly. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we need to remember as believers is you have to protect your faith. Mm -hmm. You have to um, you have to to take care that you don't <coughs> be deceived and let fear right. come in and overtake your faith. So the faith is um, overall and protecting. So keep your faith alive. Yeah. I, I was trying to think of what the, what the scripture is about keeping your faith alive. Um, I don't know. Maybe it was an old song. Keep the switch of faith turned on. Yeah, I like and keep faith alive. active, active, active and alive. I like this. Uh, what this study says: Our shield of faith must likewise be complete in all its dimensions, which is that protection that you talked mm -hmm. about. It must cover our total personality, spirit, soul, and body. That shield of faith is very important. Mm -hmm. That training and exercise too that these Roman soldiers went through, they had to be beasts because they're carrying all of this heavy equipment. They had to be very strong, very muscular men in order to be able to do what they did every day. Something else interesting here. And about, they were very feared, by the way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> very feared. Um, so these shields were made out of animal hide. One other thing that they could do with these shields is saturate them with water. Why would they saturate them with water? Because the enemies would use arrows that had fire. The fiery darts mm -hmm. that Paul mentions are not just some, you know, analogy that doesn't didn't mean anything. They really did shoot fiery darts. Right. And so they could actually soak their shields in water. And so that even if the uh, dart hit, the dart would be extinguished on impact because they were water saturated. And... Ephesians 5 26 can you read that because this is just really good I'm going to talk about uh, us keeping our <coughs> our shield of faith saturated 5 26 mm -hmm. are you sure washing of water by the word oh, okay yeah I'm going to read 25 too. Husbands, okay. love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her which means set apart having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So the word is like a <coughs> washing of water. So um, with our shield of faith, when you are in the word and you are applying that to your life, it's like you're uh, caring for your, your weapon, for mm -hmm. your shield. Okay, so the meaning of taking it above all, it talks about the shield of faith, taking it above all. Um, in Greek, the phrase means all or everything. It's epipassin. And it means, it's better translated as out in front of all or covering all. So our faith is supposed to be out in front where it can cover everything. Um, mm -hmm. It's designed to be out in front where it can cover every situation in your life, where mm -hmm. it's over all. Yes, faith is critical in our yes. walk with Christ. Okay, so we've got... The helmet of salvation. So here we go. Um, take the helmet of salvation. Oh, and the sword. And, okay. Got, I, didn't, I forgot about that. The helmet of salvation. Okay. So what does the helmet protect? The right. head, the mind. Mm -hmm. The mind. Okay, you got something on that? Yeah, so we <clears> talked <throat> there... Um, 
talking about the helmet of salvation and talking about how the battlefield is in the mind. So the helmet of salvation is your mind is protected, the head is protected with the knowledge of salvation. It's that, you know, the breastplate of righteousness is your right standing, but when you renew your mind to the word of God, that helmet is over your mind and it's protecting you. Uh, it's the critical protection over your head. So the Roman soldiers' helmet um, were pretty impressive. They, they looked um, almost like a sculpture, really impressive on the top. They had engravings and etchings and they had feathers and they were, you know, they were really uh, elaborate, usually made of bronze and they had pieces of armor on them uh, that were designed to protect their cheeks and jaws. So there was things that hung down from them to protect parts of their face as well. Um, so it is a weaponry and when you think about it, uh, Paul is comparing that helmet to salvation. And salvation is the most gorgeous, the most intricate, the most elaborate, the most ornate, the, the yeah. most precious thing God could give you. And those helmets looked and, extremely yeah. um, ornate and elaborate. Right. Well, and they were designed for maximum protection. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because without that protection, besides your torso, the head is the most vulnerable part of your body. Mm -hmm. I like what this says here in this study. The mind is the area in which Christians are most regularly attacked. And I would say everybody is attacked there. Inside our minds, there is often a continuing war. Satan seeks to insinuate thoughts that will disturb us or distract us or in some other way make us ineffective in our war against him. And that's what we talked about in the last session, that mm -hmm. thoughts are very important. Yes. And you have to be careful about what thought you take, what you receive. It will make it, it will make a difference in your walk with Christ. And then we've got the sword, the of, the sword of the Spirit. Yeah, let me turn the page here. Sword. The and sword of the spirit, very important. So, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. All right, what do you got to say about that, Tina? I would say that's our most uh, powerful offensive weapon. Mm -hmm. That is what Jesus used to defeat the devil, is he used the word of God. That's our sword. So I'll look a little bit about the Roman sword. Yeah, so let me say this. Um, this is such a good study here. This, this sword can be used for both attack and defense, but it is primarily a weapon of attack. Someone has said the best defense is attack, and this is often true in the spiritual realm. So the word sword that was used in... Uh, this particular text in Ephesians 6.17 is a Greek word, machera. I may have pronounced it wrong. It's no, it's probably, is it Greek or is machera, it Latin? Machera, uh, Greek. It said it was approximately 19 to 22 inches long. So this is the, the sword that Paul was referring to. And it had a very sharp blade. It would have been relatively light, easy to carry, and it was used for close range thrusting. It was carried in a scabbard, and it also went down into the, the belt, and it was designed to inflict a mortal wound on an enemy or an aggressor. It was not any lightweight sword. Mm -hmm. It was meant a weapon to kill. Um, it was an exceptionally brutal weapon because both sides of its blade were razor sharp. It was a two-edged mm -hmm. sword. Mm -hmm. And there's other scripture it's references. It's going to kill going yeah. and coming and going. There's Ooh, another choo, scripture choo. reference that talks about the word of God as a two-edged sword. Um, in the hands of somebody who would be well-trained against their opponent, the opponent would be dead. Mm -hmm. um, it was a uh, exceptionally uh, effective weapon. And that's the sword that Paul had in mind when he was writing in Ephesians. That's the word that he used for that. So mm -hmm. um, it's 
talks about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So it is the rhema. It is the revealed word of God. Well, it's the spoken the word. The spoken word. The spoken word and of God. And we talked about that in the last session mm -hmm. where we talked about it is important what comes out of your mouth. Right. It should be the word of God. It's not enough just to know this. Mm -hmm. It has to come out of your mouth. Right. A lot of people know the word, mm -hmm. but they speak terrible things out of their mouth. They're not speaking what right. God says. This is power right. right here. And when you speak the written word of God out of your mouth against the devil, it is like that, mm -hmm. that sword, that two-edged deadly sword is coming out and it is going to defeat the enemy. And we talked about this in one of the other sessions that Jesus in Luke 4, 1 through 13, Jesus spoke, it is written, mm -hmm. it is written, it is written. That is the spoken word right there. And I want to go a little bit further and read. Uh, so, and this is in here too, verse 18. We don't often talk about this or see this. It wasn't in the little kid set, but the lance was the other part of the weapon on the Roman soldier. And read verse 18. <clears throat> With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So uh, this book on Dress to Kill, <clears throat> which is about the Roman soldier's armor, um, this person said as he studied this and studied the armor, he was perplexed because um, all scholars agree that Roman soldiers had seven pieces, pieces of weaponry in his suit of armor. They all said Paul's list of armor was incomplete that stopped short of one weapon, the soldier's lance. And this verse 18, this last weapon is prayer and supplication. That's mm -hmm. like the lance that the Roman soldier had. <clears throat> and what so, is a lance? Tina? What is a lance? I'm going to read that to you now that you ask this question. So um, the lance wasn't specifically mentioned by name, but because we have this prayer and supplication, it, when you wield the lance of prayer and supplication, it's a powerful prayer tool thrust forward in this, into the spirit realm against the work of the adversary. So there were different kinds of lances. And some were small, some were really long. If you see a picture of a Roman soldier, some of them are really long. Um, they were able to thrust through the bodies of enemy soldiers at close range. So not a sword, but almost like a spike kind of a thing. That was uh, thrown. They could throw them, or if they were close, they could, uh, they could get them close, or they could throw, throw it from afar, too. Um, so they had, there were some that were longer ones that they could throw, they could get them at a longer distance. And then when they got up on them, they would use their sword to finish them off. So there were different kinds of lances, but they are very powerful. Were a very powerful part of the Roman soldiers, um, collection of military might. Um, the Macedonians used the longest lance. It would be 21 to 24 feet long Sheesh. or... Wow. That's the length of a telephone pole. That's how long the lance could be. Um, a huge weapon of war and will require somebody to be amazing, amazingly strong to use it. So you can see how prayer and supplication mm -hmm. would be like throwing a telephone pole mm -hmm. at your enemy, a sharp, tele right. sharp, deadly pole at your enemy. That's really good. I've so, never heard that. And I think yeah. it's, um, yeah. <clears throat> is very, very good. Um, this says, um, we may fairly call it our ICBM or intercontinental ballistic missile. Um, there is armor that God has provided for us that is very powerful and very important in our daily walk with Jesus Christ. And it will bring victory into our lives. But we have to know what it is and we have to know how to use it. This is the problem with very many Christians they don't know what that is, and that creates a huge mm -hmm. issue. It creates defeat, actually, which is not good. And then that causes people to be discouraged. Oh, this doesn't work. I don't believe in God anymore. I mean, I've heard all sorts of things. It's like, wait a minute. If this is about training, it's about commitment, and just doing things that will make you strong. And if you're in an army, 
you pretty much have to do that. You have to clean your weapons, you have to know how to use your weapons, and you have to make sure that you're physically fit and you have to stay with your um, your comrades. You and you gotta put your weapons on. And you gotta put them on, <laughs> you just have to. Praise the Lord, let's pray, Tammy. As we close out this last session of Angels 101, Father, we just bless you and we thank you for your power and your anointing that you've given to us through Jesus Christ. And Lord, for every piece of armor that you've provided for us to use in our daily lives to help us be victorious. And Lord, I pray that these little <clears throat> studies that we are doing, that they will be helpful to people to reach out for more, to go to church more, to be part of the family of God more, and to put themselves out there so that uh, they can be part of this battle that we're fighting in this end time. And Lord, we just thank you for your love and your peace over us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, remember to like this video, subscribe, leave a comment, tell other people about what's going on here at Cornerstone. Click the notification bell so that you can be made aware of all the latest uploads and video live streams that we're doing. Praise the Lord. Anything else? That's it. Praise the Lord. God bless you, and we hope to see you soon at Cornerstone Alive, and we hope you have a great week.